But let me. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. When you read when you read scripture and and you say, "Oh, well, it says this, therefore I have to believe that." Um, what exactly do you think is going on there? Who are you asking? You. I, I'm asking you, Matt. Um, well, I mean, look. I, if, if you think I, that, I, well, go ahead. Well, there's there's passages within scripture that talk about the, yeah. the vain thinking of men, the vain philosophy of men, and, and it and uh, talks about uh, certain things. I just think when we're talking, when we're getting into philosophy and what philosophers say and these guidelines that have been established, um, yeah, some of them are very beneficial, but I just don't hold them as the final authority. I would but, hold scripture I'm not, above that. Yeah, I'm not really talking about that. I, look, here's the issue. When you read scripture and then you think to yourself, oh, it says that, we, uh, you think that, you know, scripture is divine revelation, therefore you ought to believe it. You're drawing an inference. You're drawing an inference, right? The inference is, is that on the one hand, you think that scripture is divine revelation. On the other hand, scripture says X, and then you conclude, therefore, I ought to believe X. But how exactly is that inference supposed to work? If you reject the laws of logic, or if you reject the view that the laws of logic ought to apply in this particular domain, that it ought to apply to spiritual matters, then you shouldn't be making inferences at all. I mean, there's no there's no principle basis on which you can make the inference that I just described. And therefore, you have no reason at all to come to the conclusion that you ought to believe the things that are in Scripture, even if you think that Scripture is divine volition. And even if you think that Scripture says X, you cannot then reach the conclusion that you ought to believe X unless you also endorse the view that the laws of logic um, or some other inferential principles apply when we're talking about spiritual matters. Well, I'm not even sure what you just said there. Are you saying that I just abandon logic completely? No, look, your, your position is that uh, when we're talking about spiritual matters, when we're talking about matters that are outside of spot, space, time, uh, the material realm, when we're talking about things, for instance, that having to do with God, um, then uh, the laws of logic do not, do not apply but if that's so, then you can't actually make any inferences on the basis of scripture, because to do so would be to presuppose that the laws of logic do apply to this domain. They do apply when we're talking about God. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both that the laws of logic apply, and therefore you can make inferences about God, and also that uh, the laws of logic do not apply. I never said the laws of logic do not apply. I said that, I'm sorry, I thought I that... said that I wouldn't say that the law says the law of non-contradiction, the law of excluded middle, and the law of identity would necessarily hold in completeness in absolute circumstances in all things. How, how do we know what the boundaries are of the application of those principles? Well, see, ultimately the, the problem is this, because what we... When you start studying something, you start seeing something that appears to be a contradiction that can't be resolved. Um, do we just say this is a contradiction, it can't be resolved, so it can't be true, even though we can't resolve it? Or we, do we just kind of say, you know what, we don't have enough information, we're limited, and just kind of kind of put it in the category of just not... No, no, look, you, you have to say the opposite of both of the... You have to say something different from both of those claims, right? I mean, no, to say that we saying, can't resolve the mystery. Literally exactly what I've been saying. Well, I, but, but hang on. If, if, if you're not saying anything different from either of those two possibilities, that's then you, in fact, been, do think the laws of logic apply to God. That's what I've been saying the whole time. What okay, I, then you, then you don't think that we shouldn't I, apply. That's why I called it a paradox and not a contradiction. No, no but, hang, but, it, but you don't think it's a paradox. A paradox would be to say that it really is contradictory. Uh, not that's a what you have to say is that it's... Well, I, I mean, usually that's the way that the word yeah, paradox not, is defined inside of philosophy. It's not necessarily synonymous. It can be. No, I, look, it, what, well, I, the way that people usually talk about these things, uh, what you just described is an apparent paradox, not a real paradox, right? It's something that appears yeah, to be paradoxical. That, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, I would say that when you're reading scripture, sometimes there are certain things that you could 
read and say that seems to be in a par paradox. But what I'm saying, yeah, right. So, so I you, so it's not that you I think that the laws of logic have some limitations on their application. Rather, it's that you think the laws of logic apply completely everywhere. But that the, uh, but there are there are some places where we're not able to make, we're not able to resolve an apparent contradiction. Right. That's different than saying that there are some places where the law of non-contradiction does not apply. Well, what I'm saying is, would I make the absolute claim that the laws of logic apply everywhere? No, I would not. Okay, but then, but then you make, then you run into the problem that I raised in the first place, right? I mean, then you, the problem is that you do you have no systematic way for reaching inferences, including the inference that there's some place where the laws of logic do not apply. Well, I mean, what I'm saying is I just don't know, I, from my perspective, because I don't live in the spiritual realm, how you could apply the laws of logic to things that are in the spiritual realm that we don't have access to right now. But we don't, we, we don't come to the laws of logic by examining the world empirically. It's not like I, I go out, uh, you know, like it, to check that every bachelor is unmarried. I don't go out and interview a whole bunch of uh, bachelors and like, you know, take a survey and then like, you know, do some statistics or something. No, I just look at the definition of the terms. I can do that completely from the armchair without ever looking at a bachelor. So the, the laws of logic are, are not the sorts of things that we gather because we, we happen to live in a world to which those laws apply. Instead, the laws of logic are what they are because we presuppose th there's, you. well, I mean, that's one way that that's one way to say it, but the, well, that's, that's I think the, the a deeper only, issue here, the only way to say we presupposed him. No, no, because there's another thing to be said here. And that's that. No, uh, what I'm it's, saying is it is impossible to not presuppose the laws of logic. It's a presupposition that can't be. Okay, but there's, but there's another thing to be said here in, the, in their favor, which is just that it, it would be, that there's nothing that would count as a, an instance in which they did not, which they did not apply. If I came to you and I said, oh, I observed a situation where the laws of logic didn't apply, then you wouldn't have to ask me what it was that I would have, that I had observed. You could reject what, I, what I'm claiming without even knowing what it is that I think that I observed. Well, actually, because there, has, there has been physicists who say that there are certain situations in the studies of quantum mechanics in which it seems like the laws of logic didn't work at all. No, that's not that's not correct. I mean, the, the quantum mechanics is have. entirely described by a self consistent mathematical theory that completely satisfies the the laws of logic. Not based on the double split experiment and stuff like that. There's actually that's not that's just, there's actually physicists who have actually said that it seems like that the laws of logic are not consistent. Right. My my realm. PhD was in philosophy of physics, and my undergraduate degree was in physics. I've taken quantum mechanics courses through the graduate level, and I have done things like the double slit experiment and variations upon it myself. That experiment does not show that there's a violation of the laws of logic. Dan, he and might I cannot do so because the, 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 the formal have. structure of quantum mechanics is a structure that assumes from the outset that the laws of logic hold. Okay, Gene, so let me get, the, so you're saying that the laws of logic the law of non-contradiction, the law of excluded middle, and the law of um, identity hold in absolute certainty in all circumstances. Yeah, that's right. Because there's nothing that could count as a counter instance. Okay, then how do you how would how would they hold outside of time, space, and matter? Because there's nothing that could count as a counter instance. I mean, for instance, they apply to question. purely mathematical objects, but purely mathematical objects how would are they, outside of time, space, and matter. What would be the experiment that you would use to show that the laws of logic uh, absolutely hold outside of time, space, and matter? Well, the whole point of the whole point is the that answer, there is no experiment exactly. to be done. So you're making an absolute claim that you can't even validate. No, I, I already gave you an argument for it, no, right? Like the argument is that there is no... It's actually admitted that you can't experiment out. So that's why you... Have you ever heard of a logical nihilist? I know what logical nihilism is. And that's a view that I reject, right? And I've given you reasons to reject it. Hold on, bro. You're super loud, Gene. You need to step away, man. But there's philosophers who do not reject it. So what is your argument? What would, How would you refute their their uh, argument against it. 
Well, as I as I said, there's no, there's no possible situation that could count as a counter instance. Well, I mean, if you talk to someone, they like, hold of necessity. If you hold to someone like Graham Priest, who holds that there's a such thing as uh, Jack called it a while ago, but like hold, the idea of true contradictions, the contradictions actually do exist, and they point to thought experiments that show that. Um, how would you refute that? Well, I would, you know, I'd have to examine the individual thought experiments, but I would point out that the thought, the various thought experiments that Graham Priest has presented are not convincing. Okay. I mean, they may not be convincing, but do you have a reputation for them? Like that, the, that is the reputation. The, oh, because you're like, what more do you want? Because you're not convinced. So the liar's paradox, the moving era paradox and others uh, that we can't really figure out, um, just these thought experiments you're saying just because we can't figure them out they seem to be paradox uh you're just not convinced but, well, hang on, but, no that's not what i would say the I, first of all i didn't say that i'm not convinced i said that they're unconvincing one of the okay. reasons that they're unconvincing is that there are other solutions of those paradoxes uh that people have put forward that do not involve paraconsistent logic so we don't need to appeal to paraconsistent logic well, the, in order to resolve those paradoxes resolving um, the liar's paradox. Well, I mean, there's multiple ones that one could appeal this, to. I mean, there could be, for example, truth this statement, gaps. This statement is a lie. Is it a lie or is it the right. truth? Well, it, it's possible that it's neither. Could be possible it's both, right? Well, that's, that's the paraconsistent solution. Yeah, but all I'm all I'm pointing out is that you don't have to go with that solution. Okay, but I mean, and in fact, the other solutions have been put forward. Do go with and that, solution. that is that the answer is it's both. It's a lie and it's the truth at the same time, and therefore it's a true contradiction. Right, I'm aware that paraconsistent logic is a thing that exists. Yeah, and see, that's that's why to me I wouldn't be so bold as to say that classical laws of logic apply absolutely in all circumstances. Now, but I think a person can generally hold to them and, and say that they generally hold, but uh, it may not be absolute in everything. That's, that's the only uh, thing I'm making. So if I'm reading scripture and I see something that seems to be a paradox, I'm not going to just say, well, this can't be true. Therefore, I'm going to reject it. Because, see, I think there's other problems that you have when you start doing that. You say, okay, well, I'm only going to believe things that are non-contradictory and therefore I'd have justification to believe them. Well, does that mean you have justification to believe that uh, a donkey once spoke to a man uh, to a man in a way that he could understand it? Because there's no contradiction there. But would that be, would it be, if that's your only application to, you know, decide what truth is, if it doesn't contradict, then you're pretty much capable of believing anything that doesn't contradict. No, right? but that's not the claim. I, I never said that we should only believe things that are non-contradictory, right? The claim would just be that one reason to believe something is that it doesn't involve contradiction. But we also have to apply other theoretical virtues, right? We have to, in the case of the donkey, the reason to, to not believe it is because we have, we, you know, we have antecedent knowledge about donkeys. We have... Um, you know, we have inductive generalizations that we can make about donkeys. Um, the the hypothesis that there once was a donkey that talked in a way that someone could understand it is not a very probable hypothesis. So, well, what's the I, I don't know. Like, that's that doesn't involve me saying that it's contradictory. There's plenty of things that don't involve a contradiction that I nonetheless so I do not be believe. Justified in believing it just because it doesn't contradict, right? No, I never said that. In fact, I said that that wasn't okay, true. So, I said the reason you're not justified okay, so, in believing it. Well, let me let me ask you this, and I've asked this multiple times in the past, and I tried to ask it earlier, but uh, I don't know if I got the question through very well. Let's imagine that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, and you're very familiar with the Scripture. Maybe someone even like Paul, uh, who uh, had a firsthand encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus. He also had firsthand discussions with the disciples meeting with them and everything that uh these disciples experienced such as paul and all the other disciples seeing jesus 
uh, or the Apostle Paul and all the other disciples and apostles, seeing Jesus walking on water, healing the blind, uh, casting demons out, um, raising the dead multiple times, doing all these things, um, and then uh, even him giving them the power to do that, and they experience all of this stuff, um, and uh, that three-year ministry. And then last of all, he raised from the dead and showed himself over 40 days, gave them the Holy Spirit, gave them the power to do this, and the rest of their life they're experiencing these things. But then there's also passages within Scripture and what they're experiencing where Jesus is saying at some points that he's forgiving sins, referring to himself as I am, the Lord of the Sabbath, all of these things, um, which obviously from their personal experience probably would be considered paradoxical in nature because here's a person who was born by a woman and yet was making these claims as well, and they were recognizing it. My, my question would be at that point is, are you obligated to go with what you experienced with Jesus Christ here? Or are you obligated to say, you know what, this one thing here, I can't resolve. It seems like a contradiction to me, so I'm going to dismiss everything else. Or maybe there's two or three things in, in Scripture that you can't resolve. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see but, why those are the only uh, options well, on the table. Your, what would be your criteria if you experienced all this? Would you first appeal, would the laws of logic come first? Or would all of these experiences that you had with the miracles uh, be superior to the laws of logic? Well, the laws of logic would come first, but I don't think you've described anything that was contradictory. Well, when Jesus being so, born uh, through a woman is also claiming to be able to forgive sins and they're recognizing he's claiming to be a uh, God. You, a mere man, as I said, claim to be God. That's what we're going to stone you for. Blasphemy. Well, obviously, that seems to be a contradiction, right? Maybe you don't think it is, but a lot of people do. A lot of people say, well, there's no way God can become a man. That's a contradiction. Uh, maybe you don't think that. Um, but I'm just asking at the, that, would you be justified in rejecting what Jesus Christ did simply based on you believing it violates some law of logic? Well, if, it, if, if I believed that it was contradictory, if I believed that, then I would be justified in rejecting it. Okay. So are you willing to... But, but I, don't think, I don't think that it's necessary. I don't think what you've described necessarily has to involve a contradiction. And I don't think that that's the first place that I would go in evaluating what the, the scenario that you've described to well, me. Brett, um, I don't think that the... Well, just for clarification. The way to... You were not in the conversation yeah. last night, but how this all got started was I was in a conversation with another atheist who insisted the Trinity uh, is a contradiction. Oh, well, I reject that view. I reject the view oh, that, the, okay. that the Trinity is contradictory. Okay. Great. I mean, I'm glad. I, I mean, that's uh, actually kind of refreshing to hear. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't think it's plausible. But as far as uh, it being a contradiction, I think the statement that there is one divine substance and three divine persons does not itself entail a contradiction. And I'd go further. I'd point out that the, the best arguments against the Trinity, like those that are put forward by Dale Tukey, um, do not involve the claim that the, that the Trinity is contradictory. But you think the hypothesis... In fact, Tukey has been okay. quite clear that, okay. the, 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 on his view, the Trinity is not contradictory. <clears throat> but you think the hypostatic union is a contradiction. Yeah, but I don't know that what he's... I don't know that all these biblical claims and all these like miraculous experiences have to involve the um, the statement that there is uh, numerically one being that is fully man and fully God. Yeah, I think my point is if if someone is thinking this through afterwards, a disciple is saying, you know, how's this all? You know, I don't understand how all this works, and even. Paul refers to it as mysterious in different passages. My point is, um, if you experience this stuff like Paul did and John and Matthew and the disciples, even Luke, who tagged along and with on Paul's journey, 
um, if you're experiencing these miracles and experiencing the work of the Holy Spirit uh, and stuff at that point, but even though you can't resolve some of these things in your mind about how the God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit can all be God um, and not, you know, violate certain uh, logic and stuff. My point is, wouldn't you be justified in believing them uh, over your just inability to fully reconcile it yourself? Sure. I mean, maybe. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. But but the but what I wouldn't do, I, I wouldn't think that there had been a violation of the of the laws of logic. I, I might think that I'm unable to resolve the um the the contradiction, and then I might think that uh you know that there has to be an explanation, non contradictory explanation. That's just that you know it's an explanation that I don't currently know, um, and. Uh, and I'd be in search of an explanation. And one of the criteria that I would use for looking for an adequate explanation, an explanation, by the way, which I might never find, is that the explanation be non-contradictory. But also, if that's not the only criterion. I mean, I th there are other... W when we talk about uh, experiences of what appears to be miraculous, I think that there are other criteria which whose application is more important than the um, than the laws of logic. I think, for instance, um, that we need to talk about how probable those, uh, those miraculous occurrences are, how probable it is that I could be mistaken about what I've experienced, how probable is it that, um, that, 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 like, that God would be producing these miraculous events as opposed to some other sort of entity. Um, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of criteria that I would want to think about applying um, other than applying the, the laws of logic. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you there. I think um, that makes sense. And that's one of the things that I'll often ask um, atheists themselves, especially here on Clubhouse, because... One of the common things I hear atheists say here when they make an argument, they'll be like, well, what's the contradiction there? What's the contradiction there? As if that's the most important thing. So I think the, and I've asked this before to, um, to atheists, not just in that scenario with the disciple, but in, but in other scenarios, um, you know, are you, do you just only consider what violates the laws of logic in that regard or, as there are other criteria you use. Yeah. And obviously right. most atheists, that's part of the criteria, but that's not the, that's not obviously um, the only criteria. And that's the only point I'm making is if the laws of logic are not the only criteria, then, then I think that leaves room for the idea that there could be some things that um, may seem to be um, paradoxical or contradictive that, and we're just not, we don't have access to the full information, the full story. Uh, so I don't think that's necessarily grounds for us to reject it. And that's what I say about scripture. Well, but, but hang on. I mean, it, so the, scripture. It, but it may be grounds to reject it. So the, the fact that something appears to be uh, paradoxical, um, you know, one possible hypothesis, one possible explanation of its appearing paradoxical is that it really is paradoxical. And so one of the things that we need to evaluate is one of the things we need to weigh is how likely is it that this is actually paradoxical and how likely is it that we're just not in full possession of the, of the facts? I would say most likely that we were just not in full. When it comes to um, things such as our study of something outside the universe, you know, trying to in the universe or something, or even on, in, in the world itself, that there could just be facts that we're don't have available to us yet. But I, look, we I, I don't know what, I, I, at that point. I, I have no idea what difference it makes to talk about whether we talk about something within the world, because for instance, I mean, we already have a perfectly good example of, of the formal study of something that is completely disconnected from the physical world, namely mathematics. But yet, when we do mathematics, 
we assume uh, that the that the laws of the traditional laws of logic hold. I mean, there's, there's no, um, I, I, just, I don't, I can't see, like, for instance, what, what about something being physical would mean that it's uh, such that the laws of logic would, um, you know, particularly apply to that thing as opposed to other sorts of things. I, I think that if, if we're going to accept uh, the laws of logic, then it's most plausible for us to accept that, they, that the laws of logic are, they hold necessarily. That no state of affairs, whether a physical state of affairs or otherwise, could count as a counter instance. Well, like like when you're thinking about stuff like consciousness, and they call it the hard problem of consciousness. Um, most of the time, atheists don't just assume that um, dualism, that mind exists outside of the body, simply because of the hard problem of consciousness. Even though the obvious question is how much mindless material would you need to mix together to get a mind and that's well i mean I, in my view material is isn't mindless so i don't so oh, i would you reject don't, you don't think material is mindless that's right oh okay so so you're saying that material uh has some sort of components that mix together somehow unguided uh could produce uh, a mind well, I'm saying more than that. I'm saying that that all material uh, has mental qualities. Okay, so like a, a brick. Whether it forms a mind or not. A brick, um, a stick, all of that has some sort of, um, of uh, mind qualities within it. Yeah, it has, a, it has a mental aspect. That's the view that I think is most plausible. Okay, um... What is that called anyway? There's a term for that, where everything. Well, I mean, there's so there's a bunch of different views in this ballpark, but the particular view that I'm most attracted to is uh, sometimes called Russellian monism, other times called neutral monism. So my view is that there's there's one fundamental neutral kind of stuff. That neutral kind of stuff has mental qualities and it has physical qualities. And moreover, when uh, even though all uh, all instances of that neutral stuff have like a mental aspect to them, it's it's none the it's nonetheless the case that only when they um, when they form together into the right sorts of configurations that they produce a full blown mind. Because you see, minds have organization to them, right? Like we, we have coherent thoughts, and we have a visual field that's not just disorganized. In order for that to happen, it has to be that that stuff has the right sort of organization. In a brick, it's, it's not organized in the right sort of way. All the components of a brick on this view have mental aspect to them. But it doesn't form into a mind because the components of the brick don't have the right sort of organization. Okay, so uh, are you saying that a brick... Um has some sort of intellect within it? Well, I wouldn't use the word intellect. I mean, intellect, usually when we use the word intellect, we mean things like rational capacities. We mean the, 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 um, the capacity and the ability to form and go through some process of reasoning or intellection. Um, I don't think that bricks have that. I think that in order for a system to have something like that, it needs for its parts to be organized in the right sort of way. Okay, so uh, there are a lot of atheists that would probably think that that was pretty absurd uh, to have that position. Well, they can Re think that, but I, but I think that their well, position is well, absurd. Th yeah, there's actually, there's actually I'm with atheists, you, Dan. As a panelist, I'm with you. There's actually atheists that would say, no, that the material does not have mind-making components in it. It doesn't have the capacity to produce intellect. and they, and, But yet... Here we have the intellect that is here today, the mind that is here that we just uh, assume, and they can't really rationalize. Well, look, I, I think no, I, I think most atheists would would disagree with what you're saying right now. I think most atheists no, I've, would grant. I've talked to some that would. I've, I've talked to some. Asked them and said, uh, "Do you believe that the material, like in within the world, has mind 
is it mindless? And they would say yes. And then I would ask them, then how much mindless material would it take to produce a mind? But hang on, you're and changing you're the question. No, that's what I said at the beginning. You the, said the question that you asked produce. me was about intellect. No, I, intellect I, I, and mind are not I, the same I, I thing. I asked you about mind, and you said that, yeah, you believe it had mind. So that's what I'll ask atheists. I'll say, do you believe, and this is my point. It's not really to get into that argument, but my point is I will ask atheists, say, okay, do you believe the material in this world has mind uh, in it, like you pick up dirt, you, everything that exists in the world uh, has mind, is is mindless or mindful or whatever, you know, they will say it's mindless. And then I'll ask him, well, then how much mindless material do you add together to produce a mind? Well, that's- Because you're not defining your terms. Well, I just- I Yeah, you're just not defining them. your terms. They don't- Well, look, I mean, I, I would object to what you're saying, what uh, saying in the following way. I, I would say, look- It appears to be illogical, and yet atheists believe it. it no, I don't think that's- I don't think you've stated that correctly. So look- I know, the, I'm just it's, saying, but wait, the way I actually frame the question to atheists, I've had them answer it that way. Okay, but you're not framing the question correctly. Well, the, they just, you know, the, the question, they didn't really complain about the question thing. that you just posed was how much mindless material do you have to add together to produce a mind? Correct. And even if someone is a kind of, is the kind of radical materialist that you're describing, they should say that that question is indeterminate. And the reason they should say that that question is indeterminate is because it's not a matter of merely adding together a bunch of material. No one thinks that the entire planet Earth is like a coherent mind. Instead, what you should ask is how do you add together material into the right sort of configuration to produce a mind? Because radical materialists have the view that even though matter is ordinarily mindless, when you put together matter into the right configuration, it forms into a, into a mind. Yeah, but that still almost is like saying, okay, we can just rearrange the zeros and we can add them together and just rearrange them and still get one. And so what I'm saying no, is that because that because look, I mean, really, I mean, look, I, that doesn't really so, conform to logic very well, but yet people accept it. It it, it forms it conforms completely to logic. Look, the, I disagree. I think it's completely. Illogical. If if I ask you how much how many water atoms, sorry, not atoms, how many water molecules do I need to add together to form a block of ice instead of liquid water? Well, the answer to that is that that's that's a badly formed question. In order to get a block of ice, it's not that you need to like keep adding water molecules together. Rather, it's that you need to put water molecules into the right configuration. In one configuration, they can form ice. In another configuration, they can form a liquid. There's what just I'm nothing. If, if you if you run it like this, if you if you say mindless material equals zero because there's no mind material within it. And then mind is one, then how, no matter how you rearrange the zeros and whatever you do. Yeah, but you could say the same thing about, my point. you could say the same thing about liquid water in solid ice. No, you could say, you well, way, each of the water molecules have, so has zero have liquidity the, in it. They already have the components. What I'm saying is this has no components. No, but <laughs> Matt, <clears throat> Matt, you're using the wrong microphone. Fix it, please. Hurry up. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to Look, gonna have what to you're talking about. Uh, but that, that's my point. My, my main point is that uh, there's a lot of things that atheists will believe that is completely irrational as well, but they still believe. Well, I'm an atheist and I disagree with what you've said, what, what, you've, what you've said that atheists know, think for all sorts of I'm reasons. He's just appealing to incredulity, Dan. That's it. He I'm thinks it's think incredulity. It's, it's just that he's just making the fallacy of composition. He doesn't know that he's doing I'm just that. saying that people will believe illogical things without justification. Oh, lucky you. Uh, that's not well, okay, right. but when they yeah, do yeah, that, that they're... I think point. the Christian has more justification in accepting scripture than some atheists do to believe certain that's things. Stupid. That's my point. You could check the like, like, Well, okay, there could be atheists that, that believe all kinds of silly things. I don't care. <laughs> you think that has something to do with Gene's point against you, against this, your, your logical nihilist bullshit, Matt? Just because someone thinks something irrationally doesn't mean that they want to think it. They want to think things that are irrational. Well, and, they want. No, if, I think they want to know if they're being rational. No, I mean even when you point it out, they still don't change their mind. 
Well, they could be making a mistake. They can be stubborn. They can be ignorant. They can be, I, they can be dogmatic. It doesn't matter. The, the fact that someone else makes a mistake in reasoning doesn't justify you in making a mistake in reasoning. Well, I mean, like I said, <laughs> my view, my view well, is... Well, how would Matt know he doesn't hold to the law of non-contradiction? So by what method is, is he trying to assist your view? My view is that just because scripture appears to be paradoxical in some cases and we don't have the full answer would be no justification for me to say, oh, yeah, this violates the laws of logic. I need to say it's not true. That's my main point. Well, I agree with that. That's that's obvious. But, and I, am, I mean, who would deny I that? Mean, I, am, I mean, it, I am pleasantly surprised that you said that you don't think there's any contradiction within the Trinity. That uh, That's very nice to hear because a lot of it is... Uh, uh, he's going to misunderstand yeah. that. See, Gene, you have to be very specific, right? When you were saying that about the Trinity, you were talking about a concept of the Trinity. Do you think that that, that all concepts of the Trinity are... Are, are have no contradictions, Gene? No, I think that you can you can formulate. Right, so you have to be clear the... when you're talking to Matt, right? You have to be really clear when you're talking to Matt because he's going to just take something and run with it, right? So please be clear. Yeah, right. So look, I, well, let, the, let me the, there are there are concepts of the Trinity gonna, that are contradictory. But the bare the bare Trinitarian formula okay. is is just clearly not contradictory because you can't derive a, a, a sentence of the form p and not p from it. Right, the, the, but that doesn't mean either that there are no contradictory formulations of the Trinity, and it also doesn't mean that the Trinity is itself plausible, or that we should believe it, or that anyone is justified in believing it. Right, okay, the, the yeah, statement no, that there is I one God and, and I mean, three I, persons I itself is not a logical contradiction. But there's ways you could cash that out, explain what those uh, your commitments are that itself would. Right, and in fact, you know, I, I would point out, does, I would point out the following. So, so like, I, I would find out the following. I think the most straightforward understanding of the term God is just that God is a divine person, right? When I, when I talk to Jewish friends of mine and I tell them, oh, the Christians say that they're monotheists because they have one divine substance, they look at me like I'm talking crazy things because the, like, to, to any Jewish person to say that someone is a monotheist because they believe that there's a single divine substance it's just complete nonsense. I mean, the, who, whoever thought that God was a substance? The most straightforward reading of the term God is just that God is a divine person. And if that's what the term God means, then there is, like, in fact, a contradiction in, uh, in the Trinity because Trinitarianism holds that there, there's one divine substance and three divine persons and that there's only one God. But, you know, again, if there's three divine persons and what a God is is just a divine person, then the fact that there are three divine persons there means that there's three gods. Well, let, Wait, me, let me just, before I leave, could I just ask one question to Gene, maybe to clarify. Gene, would you say that based on how um, the church fathers derived from Scripture the idea of the Trinity, and we would agree that the Trinity... Uh, word is obviously not found in the bible but the, but the scripture that they derive this idea from would you say that there's any contradictions within those scriptures that they derive the idea of the tr trinity from when i said there's a contradiction within the scriptures yes well i mean i, I think that there are well, just, well just <laughs> i mean I, the, the, the question is a bit complicated yeah where they derive the trinity well from. you you probably think the you probably think that the you probably agree with Tuggy that the scriptures don't actually teach a Trinitarian. Right. No, that's that, that's right. I, I would also point out that the church fathers are not uniform in their in their views. I mean, for instance, there's this period of time in which you have a whole bunch of logos theorists, and logos theory is just clearly not Trinitarian. So if people like Origen and Tertullian were church fathers, but were not Trinitarians. So I don't think that it's clear that the that the you know I, I don't think on the one hand that the that the Bible teaches the Trinity and I also don't think it's it's I also don't think that the the Church Fathers uniformly were Trinitarians, but you know if you ask me are there contradictions in Scripture, well I think that there are contradictions in Scripture, but you know if you ask me well are there contradictions in the passages that people in like the proof texts that Trinitarians appeal to, well I'm not sure I'd have to look at those in particular. Okay. 
So uh, just for clarity, do you believe that Jesus in Scripture um, was making himself out to be God based on some of the Scripture? And that he was making this Holy Spirit out to be God as well in the sense that when you deny it, it's blasphemy and it will be unforgiving? No, I think that Tuggy and others have, have made a, a fairly compelling case that Jesus does not claim that of himself. So you, Tuggy doesn't believe Jesus ever claimed to be God. Well, it depends on what we mean exactly by by God. I mean, so the there are a couple of passages that Tuggy talks about where Jesus refers to himself as Teos, right? Using the Greek word that is sometimes translated as God. But Jesus also says that like all people, all humans are gods, using that same word. Yeah, but he doesn't he doesn't get uh they don't attempt to stone him when he's doing that. I mean, when, there are certain passages when he's saying certain Well, but wait, but wait, when they, when they attempt to stone him because they think that he's claiming to be God, his response is to say, uh, not that, oh, you shouldn't stone me because I really am God. His, his response is to, you know, there's this passage about, well, you know, all people are called God and, you know, the term God is used in many ways and so on. Yeah, but that's problematic because if you keep reading that passage, he's actually putting himself above all other gods in that that context. Because he says, "Well, he can be yeah, above all other I, people without himself if being if he Yahweh." Them, if he calls them gods, then you know the son of God, or you know, so he's he's putting himself above all of them, even within that context. And it course, doesn't matter. I mean, there can be there can be people that are above all other people. Okay, so does Tuggy believe Jesus is a created being? I believe so, yeah. Okay, so the source of eternal life uh, can be non-eternal. Are, are you, so, you know, what passage are you referring to John, for the claim that Jesus is the source of eternal life? Jesus Much said better, Kepler, I've never heard John, you speak this way. John three sixteen, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. And there's other passages where Jesus refers to Himself as uh, the source of eternal life. So, uh, well, at least in the in the if, in John six three sixteen, the claim is not that Jesus is the source of eternal life. The claim is that the Father, via the Son, via the you know the the vehicle of the Son, grants eternal life to people. Yeah, but then that would violate the Old Testament scripture where it says a man cannot die for the sins of another. How does Tuggy reconcile that? I don't, I mean, I, <laughs> I'd have to go back and look, you know, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just curious. I, yeah, I, I didn't come here prepared to debate would, scripture, but just, I'm just curious. But yeah, that's that's my point. Um, I mean, we can, I just uh, you y'all guys can move on. Uh, I was just curious to see if you thought that Jesus did claim to be God in scripture, like um, uh, most even non-believers have conceded that yeah, Jesus is claiming to be God according to some passages of scripture. Um, and I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Right, like I said, I think that there are passages where Jesus refers to himself as Theos, but but also that the term Theos, you know, even though it's often translated as God, isn't the same thing as the monotheistic conception of God. I mean, in Greek, the term Theos really just means immortal. So the yeah, I mean the mere I claim. Say, if you had just individual passages, then I'd say, okay, well, maybe that would be harder to make a case. But when you, uh, it's been described by some theologians that um, Jesus is God claims in in the Book of John are just more out there and a and right there in your face, but in the other Gospels. It's systemic or, you know, it's it's within, it's implied, even though it's not out there in your face. 
Like, yeah, I, I, well, I think that something like that is is true, right? I think that it's true that in John, it's there's um, the kind of supernatural status of of Jesus is is elevated and pronounced over the other gospels, but but I don't think that the I don't think that, for instance, uh, either the Trinity or the Incarnation are implicit in uh, in the Bible. And I think the mainstream historical consensus is is that the both the Trinity and the Incarnation were doctrines which were not did not appear in Scripture, but had to be worked out over the first three centuries of Christian history. I think the biggest problem I have to that argument um, is what would be the necessity of it if it wasn't in Scripture, because obviously. Well, I mean, they they thought that it. Easy, they, easy the, the, to, they thought that it was in Scripture, right? Like, well, you just the, say they the people who worked out the Trinitarian doctrines thought that pe- the people who worked out the Trinitarian doctrine thought that it was that thought that it was implicit in Scripture. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't that kind of imply that these people uh, who studied scripture, and even today we have modern examples. Look at someone like William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig is a philosopher. He loves philosophy. And he's even gone as far as to say that he doesn't think a person has to uh, believe in the Trinity in order to be saved. They accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. They don't even have to believe, oh, yeah, God is triune in order to be saved. Um, But yet he has attempted to make his own model of the Trinity. Now, the obvious question to me would be if if he doesn't believe that you have to believe in the Trinity to be saved and he's really into, you know, philosophy, then what would be the purpose in him trying to come up with a model of the Trinity if he didn't really think that? Because he's a conservative really evangelical did. Christian, I, I don't like it. Doesn't I mean the the answer to that is just obvious, a lot of right? Liberal Christians too. Oh what no! What is that? It's it's Detroyer. You're Mickey Mousing again. Yeah, Detroyer sounds awful. But but my point is, there's a lot of what's considered is identified better? as left left wing liberal yes. Christians yes. as well. So okay. that's. I just don't, that's still the, I mean, and and it's not like um, William Lane Craig wouldn't be able to get a lot of support if he decided, uh, oh, yeah, I'm going to just decide the Trinity's not in Scripture. I just, I just, it just, to me, it just doesn't make sense why. I mean, Catholic intellectuals have been saying for a long time that the Trinity is not in Scripture, at least not explicitly. Well, what I'm saying is if it's not in Scripture and it's not really, a big issue. I just don't understand why the church fathers. Well, like I didn't, I didn't say it wasn't a big are. issue. I mean, the reason that Catholics believe it, even though it's not in Scripture, is because it was established by ecumenical councils that they think had divine sanction. Well, don't you think they were actually studying Scripture when they come to this conclusion? Yes, but I think that they were also influenced by Greek philosophy, and that they were influenced by Greek philosophy to develop things like logos theory. Well, and yeah, that the tr- and that Trinitarianism grows out of logos theory. Yeah, but if they're influenced by Greek philosophy, then Aristotle was uh, from Greek philosophy. So it seems like to me that would only be an argument against it. They would be more apt to avoid the Trinity if it were not there. That's what it seems like to me. No, not not if I mean if if a Catholic thinks that the ecumenical councils had divine sanction. And that, and they think that the, you know, the ecumenical council settled on the Trinity. Then they're going to think that the Trinity has divine sanction, even if the, even if those same ecumenical councils appear appeal to Aristotle and Plato. I mean, it, you know, also yeah, it's I it's mean, way too easy for for a Christian to say, look, the reason why there's this stuff appears in Greek philosophy is because God, you know, like gave a partial glimpse of the truth to. Greek uh, philosophers, right? I mean, that was a common retort during the medieval period. Okay, but but I think the problem still is Aristotle would have had a heavy influence as well, and I just don't understand. It, to me, it still doesn't make sense that they would, or uh, that they would say, okay, you know, well, you know, this is 
we need to conform to Greek philosophy here. We need to establish this doctrine of Trinity. I just think the reason why they established this idea of the Trinity is because that's actually what's revealed in Scripture. That's what I believe. Well, I, I, that's not a historical I mean, argument, right? Like, that's not... So, look, I, I agree that they thought that it was... They thought that that was the best way of interpreting Scripture, and they brought to bear the best of Greek philosophy to try to interpret Scripture. See, I but that doesn't mean that they got the right answer about what Scripture says. That just, yeah, and see, that to me, I've heard that argument before, but that just doesn't make sense to me to say, oh, they were influenced by Greek philosophy, when one of the most famous Greek philosophers was Aristotle himself, which to me would obviously well, prove problematic to... Who the were the first people... Who were the first people con converted to uh, Christianity, Matt? Who were they? Who were they? They were the disciples of Jesus Christ, Jewish. No, they were the Gentiles, no, right? They were the Jews. Who were the Gentiles? Every one of them were Jews. Jesus but, look, but I think it's clear that the Christianity grew among the Gentiles in the first three centuries, and that Paul's mission was primarily preaching Christianity to the Gentiles. Which, by the way, is what's right. And who were the Gentiles, right? Matt? They were the Greeks and the Romans, right? What did yeah. they believe before they believed Christianity? They believed Greek religion, right? Which was influenced by what? Greek philosophy, right? So you're saying they tr they tried to to conform the pagan gods, the multiple polytheistic gods. With no, I I don't think that's not that's not what I would say. I I would say that's that they point. tried to reconcile Greek and Roman philosophy with uh, with scripture because they thought that Greek and Roman philosophy were, had a lot of things going for them. And they thought they, they, they you know, they had a commitment to scripture. So they, they wanted to combine them together. Just like today, a Christian might think that, uh, well, geology and, bio and biology have a lot going for them. So we need to find a way to reconcile Genesis with uh, what we know from geology and, and biology. So like, okay. that's, then, then that that's always been why were they, a part of Christian intellectual life. But why were they persecuted by the Romans if they were trying to reconcile it all? Why were they persecuted by the Romans? Because they refused to participate in the in the celebration of the Roman gods. Okay, so it doesn't seem like they were that concerned with trying to reconcile it. They were willing to go to the death. No, I didn't. Again, I did not make the claim. I, hang on, I did not make the claim that they were trying to reconcile Roman polytheism and Christianity. That's not the claim. The claim is that they were trying to reconcile Roman philosophy, which they they think, amazing. which they didn't think had necessarily had a I commitment think, to polytheism. And I think that that's actually more problematic to the argument because if we're so interested in trying to reconcile Roman Greek philosophy then it would be less likely that they would have come up with the Trinity. So, see, that's why I just don't think... Why? I mean, there, there, were, there were Greeks who had things that were similar to the Trinity. I don't know why, like, that would be so... such a strange thing to say. Um, yeah, I mean, I just... I just don't think the argument works as well. Because... I, well, <laughs> but why? Like, folks like Plotinus had something that resembled the Trinity. It wasn't the Trinity, but it had some resemblance to it. No, no. And we know of first century Jewish people who were contemporaries of the of writing of the, of the New Testament who were doing exactly this project of trying to reconcile Roman philosophy with their Jewish beliefs. People like Philo of Alexandria... I think the reason why they were recognizing it is because they were actually recognizing it. It was foretold in Scripture in the Old Testament and revealed in the New Testament. Well, well then you're going to have to give question. me an explanation for what it was that Philo of Alexandria was doing. I don't know what he was doing. Well, then I don't know why we're even having this discussion. You need to go actually I, read these historical sources. I don't either, but I've got the Bible. And when I read the Bible, I can clearly see elements of the Trinity in the Old Testament. And what I believe was... No one denies that there are ways to argue from the that, Bible for the Trinity. The question is not whether that's possible to do. The question is whether or not that's the right interpretation of the Bible. Well, see, I would say it is the right interpretation, and to me, that would actually support... Origen and Tertullian would say that, or church fathers would say that that's not the right interpretation of the Bible. just got it wrong, if that's the case. 
Well, okay, but, but I, I mean, we'll just, look, we'll just, that's fine. I think that I think the Trinitarians got it wrong. We'll just have to agree to disagree because I've seen these arguments before of why the Trinity supposedly. But you haven't bothered to go and read these historical sources, I so I don't know why we're even like. I just don't think they hold water. Is my is my. Yeah, but you have no reason to say that. You haven't I'm examined not, the. I'm not convinced. Yeah, but you're not convinced in just, in spite of the like fact that you haven't actually read the historical sources. Just like just like you're not convinced that the laws of logic do not hold in absolute in all circumstances, uh, or that there, you know, there's some times where they wouldn't hold. You said you're not convinced by those arguments. I'm not convinced by the arguments that they. Yeah, but I'm an hard. expert in philosophy, right? I earned my PhD in philosophy. I I'm have read. I have read those arc. I've read the. I've read about paraconsistent logic. I've read through the paradoxes or the supposed paradoxes that it's supposed to resolve. And I've seen other ways of resolving those paradoxes. You, on the other hand, have not, in fact, read the historical sources. You I've haven't read been, people like Philo of Alexandria. I've, I've, I've you haven't read Plotinus. Scripture. So I don't know why you, you are able to... Scripture since 1994. I've read the Bible. It doesn't matter whether you've studied I've Scripture. Read, I've read, I've read the claim, is, the claim read, here I've is about whether the... It's about... It's even worse. The claim... I've, I've the, I've heard the arguments, and not I only has he not fall, read it, they fall flat. He's not even and, listening and to you. They, what I'm saying is the arguments fall flat, and we'll just have to agree to. You don't know what the arguments even are. We'll just have to agree you to give any because I think they fall woefully short. You don't know what they are. You don't know that they fall woefully I've short heard, because you haven't examined I've the evidence. Provided a refutation and explanation for everything you brought up. It wasn't even hard. I didn't. Even, no, you haven't. I didn't even have to go to any sources because I knew the arguments. When I asked you what it was that Philo Alexander was up to, you said that you didn't know well, because I, you hadn't read him. Yeah, Philo Alexander doesn't really concern me. When you said that they can't... I don't know why. The, the question was about what was going on in first century Judaism. What you, what you were claiming is that uh, you said that, that they were trying to reconcile Greek philosophy first and foremost. It's what you first said. Um, no, that's not yeah, the that's, claim. That, that's what you, yeah, that's what you first said. And then Sean no, that's not the claim. Said, Sean kind of jumped in implying they were trying to reconcile polytheism, which obviously that wouldn't work. I don't think that's what he was claiming either. Look, you, the, the problem then is... Started, then you started talking about Roman philosophy, uh, and they weren't trying to... Yeah, because it was a Roman context. Religions. You were saying Roman philosophy, um, and I've heard those arguments, I just don't think they hold water. And I've seen... Why? That, you know, so, because I just think that scripture, because I've also studied the Old Testament... I believe that the the Trinity is in the Old Testament. We, it's just not recognizable until it's revealed in the New Testament. Okay, have you read have you read Del Tuggy? Del Tuggy? No, but after what you just said, yeah. he I, I apparently he couldn't even. When I ask about how does he reconcile that a man can't die for the sins of others, you didn't have an answer for that. Yeah, because I'm not him. Okay, well I've. I have no people that have interviewed him and talked about him. Maybe I'll look into him and see what he has to say. Does that sound good? So look, I, you know, I think if you, if you really are serious about this issue, what you're going to have to do is what the rest of us philosophers do, which is to read the people who argue against our position. So you need to go and read people like, like Tugi who provide the best arguments against the Trinity.